I know there's uh, a lot of talk about campus lighting retrofits or lighting retrofits in general. So um, what I'd like to talk about today is one of the large lighting retrofit projects that we're undertaking across campus and we're doing it in conjunction with the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation which provides a, a partial grant funding for the project. Just as a, as a kind of a background to start off with, um, some of the sustainability goals for U, UIUC campus as a whole. Um, the first and foremost in my mind is that we want to achieve a 10% energy reduction in three years. That's pretty ambitious. Um, I think we can get there. It's going to take a lot of work. Uh, UIUC is a signatory to the American College and University President Climate Commitment. One of the things that it comes along with that is that we are required to develop a plan to reach, reach carbon neutrality. I don't know how much time we're going to have to actually reach carbon neutrality, but uh, we at least have to have a plan. Uh, some of our other efforts that we're doing as sustainability, as probably many of you know, are uh, new construction projects and large remodel projects are all going to be LEED Silver certified at a minimum. And the ones that are already either recently completed or hopefully underway are uh, the new BIF building. Lincoln Hall renovation future is a little bit questionable at this point. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Huff Hall, the new NCSA Petascale, which is a little surprising in that it is a supercomputer that's going to use a whole lot of electricity, but the building itself aside from the computing component is going to be LEED Silver certified. And then the Illinois Fire Service Institute, which will be coming soon. Um, our campus strategic plan features several sustainability aspects, including recycling, um, things like that. But we really do still, as a campus, have a need to develop a truly comprehensive sustainability policy that, that addresses all aspects of sustainability. I like this slide because it's like, whoa, stagger you with the numbers. These are our energy costs for the last several years. And the FY08 number just came in a few weeks ago, higher than we expected. So if your power bill you think was bad, ours is worse. And it's just going to keep getting worse. Energy costs really probably won't be going down. And so anything we can do to reduce consumption is going to have the biggest impact on the bottom line. Yeah? What happens between uh, 06, 07 if the reduction? I actually don't know the answer to that. I expect, um, because these are our costs, so I think fluctuations in natural <coughs> gas pricing. So it was more coal burn then? It, it may be. I'm not really positive. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Feel free to jump in with any questions at any point. If you're interested in knowing how we compare to our peers, um, here are the Big Ten universities. And that's energy usage in kilowatt hours per square foot of building. So you can see that we are towards the top end. Um, we also have more research than some of these facilities, and research tends to use more energy. Um, but that's just kind of an interesting, interesting graph, I think. Um, some of the other things that motivated our lighting retrofit project in specific and our approach to the lighting retrofit are a large number of facilities. The 700 locations is actually kind of a guess. We have in the thousands of building IDs, but then many of them are sort of cow barns, um, depending on um, how many houses and everything you count. Uh, we, we have hundreds of buildings at least. Um, so we really needed something that we could implement in all of those buildings. And Utility fund shortfalls, that um, goes back to the previous slide on our, our annual utility costs. 
We also have a huge deferred maintenance backlog, which many of you may have heard about. Uh, at this university, on our campus alone, we have over $400 million in deferred maintenance. And that is maintenance that should have been getting done on these buildings over the years. Routine, you know, end of life cycle on equipment, things that need to be replaced and haven't been. So one of the neat things about a lighting retrofit is that it addresses some of our deferred maintenance needs as well. Um, so we can kind of kill two birds with one stone if we, if we are doing it right. Um, we also, as with energy, energy, any energy saving um, initiative, you need to implement it quickly because every day that meter is turning and you're, sp and you're losing money. So we needed to come up with a solution that could be done across the board that we could get boots on the ground, as I put it, quickly and implement them right away with obviously limited staff resources. Um, one of the things that kind of goes into that is it, being a lighting designer, I would like nothing better than to have the resources to go into every room in every building on our campus, evaluate its lighting completely, see how it meets the needs of that room and the uses of the space, come up with a customized solution that is the best for the, each room on campus. We don't have that kind of resources. So we need something that we can say, well, in every room that has a fluorescent light, we're going to change out the fluorescent light to a better fluorescent light. And it's really that simple. We're losing out on some opportunities for savings in special cases, but sort of the volume makes up for the specifics. I like to think of it in this recent election, there was a lot of talk about a hatchet versus a scalpel. This is the hatchet. We'll come, with, we'll come and do the scalpel later. Um, and obviously cost is, is a motiv motivating factor probably should have been first on the list, but uh, nobody likes to talk about costs as being first. This slide is an interesting one. I lifted this from another presentation at a seminar I attended, and I almost put it up to criticize it or to get people thinking, but if you look at return on investment by various types of energy saving upgrades, um, at the top you have behavioral changes. Well, those are free, so your return on investment is immediate, 100%. Um, simply turning the lights off or turning the thermostat down or what have you costs no money. At the bottom end, you have things like photovoltaic systems, which have a really long payback time because of their high upfront investment. Um, you have a lot of other things in the middle. Insulation tends to be a really good one. Um, but th this actually puts lighting a little further down at about a five, four to five year payback. And what we've actually seen, that's not too far off if you would take the lighting project in and of itself, but with the incentive programs that are out there helping to reimburse the cost of the project, we actually do much better and we wind up more, oops, we wind up more in the, uh, 35% ROI range. Okay, so why, why lighting? Why choose lighting for your target upgrade instead of, say, an HVAC or uh, an insulation upgrade, something like that? Um, lighting is very easy. It's not invasive. On our, our retrofit projects, some people come in, they set up a ladder, they open the door, they change some wires out and some components. They close it. They're gone. It's not messy. You don't have to remove people from their work areas. Um, so it, it works very well with buildings that are in use and can't be rescheduled. Um, the upgrades also increase the quality of light. The old fluorescent T12 fixtures have about a 65% um, color rendering index. It's a measure of color quality. Um, the new ones were at were at 92 percent, 85 percent. 
Um, along with that comes a little productivity gain. People feel better in their spaces. Um, so that's also very highly visible to the people in the building. Everybody notices immediately when something changes with their lighting. Well, maybe not everyone. Many people, many people notice immediately when something changes, and, and this is really a, a change for the better. Uh, the buildings that we've completed so far, the building occupants have said, wow, it's, it's better, it's brighter, it's cleaner, it feels nicer in my office now. Uh, reliability and maintainability is kind of a side benefit, but it's an important one to us that these systems are really at the end of their life. We have, you know, ballasts that are 20, 30, 50 years old in some cases, and those things of that age that have uh, failures, we're putting in all new. So we're seeing a, about a, between a two to five year payback, and that range is so wide because in some buildings, we're able to achieve more energy savings than in others. Some buildings have more restrictions in terms of only being able to work at night. That increases the cost. So there's kind of a range there. On average, so far, we're a little bit less than three years, about 2.8 year payback. So all those things really put together um, means that lighting is the, the low hanging fruit in any energy saving strategy. So much so, in fact, that uh, it's been talked about as a sweetener, if you will, to other projects. Um, if you're looking for a project as, depending on the, the program you're working with, it may be required to have overall a 10-year energy payback or overall a 7-year energy payback. If you're able to combine lighting, which has a very good payback, with some other energy saving things, such as controls, that save a lot of energy but are more expensive then your entire package put together as, as one piece will have that required payback that you need to achieve. Just a quick question. These payback periods are calculated on current energy costs or projected future energy costs? Current energy costs. So um, all, all the numbers that I use are based on seven cents per kilowatt hour um, which is our best guess as to our energy costs here on campus for the past year. Um, looking forward, it's hard to predict how that will change because, yes? Uh, in the same line, are you using real world labor costs in your calculations? Yes, I'll get to that for sure. This picture I just kind of like um, to remind everyone that the uh, vast, vast majority of the energy used in any product is, is not used at the beginning or the end, but it's in the middle every day when that product is uh, serving its function and being used. So our project is in, in conjunction with the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation, which maybe many of you are familiar with. We have four projects right now with them. Um, the Miscanthus Biomass Power Plant, the Wind Turbine, the sledding retrofit project, and they also contributed part of the cost of the photovoltaic system at BIF. A couple of features about that lighting upgrade grant. The incentive is based on a demand reduction of 60 cents per watt. Um, it's applicable to any new or retrofit fixtures, just about anything you can do. You say how many watts it's going to save, and that's what your incentive will be. Um, you do have to be pre-approved and execute the project on your own. When it's done, you get a reimbursement. There's another program out there, which is very similar, but not the same. It's the DCEO <coughs> Public Sector Electric Efficiency Program. They, there are also uh, nearly identical programs in the private sector uh, for commercial businesses. And which are administered by the utility companies. Their incentives are a little bit different. They um, have a prescriptive method which specifies very specifically for certain kinds of upgrades. LED access sign is on one line, high performance T8 systems on another line. And their incentive is $7 a lamp, which averaged out comes pretty close. It's not exactly the same, but comes pretty close to the same incentive that 
um, the ICECF grant um, rate is at. They also have a, a custom incentive if you're doing something that's not on their list, which is seven cents per kilowatt hour. It's not a demand reduction basis, but it is a usage reduction basis. Um, and likewise, you have to be pre-approved, do your project, then you get paid back. So here's, here's the basic scope of our campus lighting retrofit. We have 44 buildings on our list. They add up to about 7 million square feet. Those were chosen from amongst our list of buildings that are our highest energy users. So they represent most of the large buildings on campus, most of the um, lab buildings on campus. One of the ones that, that snuck onto our list is the Advanced Computation Building. I will guarantee you that lighting is not the majority component of the electricity use in that building, but it made our list and frankly upgrading a light in one building saves the same, saves the same as upgrading it in a different building, so we let it stay. Um, we are upgrading from a linear fluorescent T12 to a high performance T8 system. If you're not familiar with that term, it's also known as Super T8, and those are uh, T8 lamp and ballast combinations which achieve above 90 lumens per watt. So it's a little bit better than a standard T8 and a standard electronic ballast would get you. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Our total cost of the project, as we've got it today, is about 4.2 million. Our total budget, as we have it today, is about 2.8 million, of which about 1.18 is the grant commitment from the ICECF. What that means, in short, is that we won't get all the way through the list of 44 buildings. The good news is that we're also saving more energy than we originally thought we would. So we're going to save the same amount of energy with about 30 buildings as we thought we would save with 44, just due to uh, correcting our expectations as we go along. We've, we've had some really good, uh, good news on that front. So in total, that's 80,000 light fixtures as of today's count. Um, our total power demand reduction is estimated at about 2.9 megawatts, which is no small peanuts. And in cost savings, that'll be about $900,000 a year. I've assumed a 12-hour usage per day for all these calculations. It's hard to say on our campus, but I think that's, I think that's as accurate as we can get. So it's 12.8 million kilowatt hours saved per year. This slide I don't expect that you'll be able to read, but I wanted to show um, a little glimpse of our spreadsheet that we're keeping track of all this. We have all of our buildings listed. They're grouped into groups that we're going to execute them in construction how many square feet, how many fixtures are in the building. Those fixture counts we're using are all converted, not to get into too much detail, but they're all converted onto a two lamp fixture basis. In other words, some, some lights have two lamps, some have three, some have four, some only have one. And in order to count them consistently and come up with some kind of a standardized energy savings number, for these purposes and for our budgeting purposes, we're converting everything to a two-lamp equivalent. So if it's a four-lamp fixture, we count it as two two-lamp fixtures. And that's actually been surprisingly accurate. <laughs> you wouldn't think it would be, but it has been. Um, so we have our costs, our watt reductions, um, annual cost savings, what we expect our grant payback to be. And then over here is our simple payback. I don't know if you can see, but 1.07 years on the English building we were able to install a lot of reflector kits there and change what used to be a four lamp T12 fixture at about 192 watts into a two lamp T8 fixture at 48 watts and actually achieve the same amount of light with a better quality. So that was huge. And one of the other buildings, uh, psychology, the payback's a little longer because we had more expenses in that building for labor and working around the very sensitive um, nature of the research and animal rooms in that building that 
that really were a little trickier for us to get into. This is another one I know it's kind of small, but uh, for each building, rather than try and do a complete set of drawings, plans, and specifications, really the, the only way we could get a handle on it quickly was to do it in a spreadsheet. Fortunately, we have a very good uh, space inventory at FNS. So we simply loaded up a list of every room in the building, what floor it's on, and how big it is. And then we filled out what type of fixtures are in that room, how many, and then any special notes. For example, this room could use an occupancy sensor. And then that spreadsheet, uh, we've actually been using a lot of our student interns to help generate these and do the walks around the buildings and, and compile the survey information. That spreadsheet is then turned over to our contractor who uses it as a checklist to make sure that he's uh, gone to every room and done every fixture, as well as if they find anything that's, that's different once they get out in the field to make, to make corrections to. Obviously, there are a lot of technical considerations from an engineering point of view. The main driving factor was uniformity. We wanted one type of ballast, one type of lamp that we could use everywhere. And so we had to really make sure that we picked the right one. Um, important things about a lamp, obviously the amount of lumens it puts out, the color quality that it has, the life, and the warranty. Um, on the ballast side, the ballast has a, what's called a ballast factor, which can be anywhere from like 0.7 to like 1.5. And that's simply a multiplier that this ballast will overdrive or underdrive the lamps. So it's really a way of tuning the amount of light output and the amount of energy consumption to get exactly where you want it to be. And we obviously needed a combination of lamp and ballast that was going to achieve that high performance T8 system. That's actually a, a specific criteria which are defined um, and need to be met in order to, to reach this uh, grant requirements. Other things to consider are the, the luminaire itself. One of the really benefits of an upgrade is that most 2 by 4 light fixtures are a white steel box and a ceiling. They don't really wear out. Um, if they're in good shape, there's no reason not to reuse them. But not all of them are like that. Some of them have lenses that are old or broken or inefficient. Uh, some of them can have reflector kits installed, which is basically a mirrored reflector that goes behind the lamps and drives more light out and down. The environment that they're in, if it's a special hot or cold area outside of a normal condition space. And that's that four lamp to two lamp, oops, reflector kits um, actually save 75% as compared to 40% for an equal number of lamps. So it's, we're really trying to take advantage of that everywhere we can. I have controls up on here, even though we're not doing anything with controls as part of our project we had hoped to. Um, Right now we have a separate project that we're looking at to try and install occupancy sensors in classrooms. Um, but it, it wasn't within the scope of this project. We do have a lot of other lighting upgrades that are not part of the site CECF, but they're going on on campus for other reasons. New construction, obviously, are getting new efficient lights, lighting systems. Anytime we remodel an area, it's getting a new efficient lighting system. Virtually all of the incandescent lights on campus, most people don't know this, but mo virtually all of them have been changed out to CFLs as part of routine maintenance, unless there's a reason they can't be. Yes? No, I was just pointing. I wasn't These haven't been, and it's probably because of the dimming in this room. Um, do you see how these are just barely on? You can't get a CFL that will dim down that low. So that's probably a reason why. There are research areas where a CFL won't work. There are any number of, of 
special cases where for one reason or another a screw in compact fluorescent I cannot be found to meet the need. I have dimmable cold cathode DSLs in my home. Are they going down to zero? The cold cathodes do dim down much further, that's true. So they're very expensive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they're nice. I have one at home too. And we have some in the library, the main library, as you walk up the stairs in the main room 200. If you look up, those ones in those old chandeliers up there are cold cathodes. Because they, they met the need in that particular space. Um, we have a project with the DCEO as part of their grant for LED exit sign replacement in many buildings around campus. That is not, that grant hasn't been approved yet. We're hoping to hear back real soon. Uh, we also have individual projects that we've gone after. I don't know if any of you have been to the ice arena lately, but they have a new <coughs> ceiling in the ice arena and new lighting as well. That saves a lot of energy over there. Uh, some of our gymnasiums and pools have gotten lighting upgrades <coughs> recently for energy saving as well as maintenance reasons. And we're starting to look at warehouses and storage facilities as well. I put this slide in. This is uh, from a great book, if any of you are interested, although I haven't checked out from the, the main library. Um, it's called Lighting Upgrades, a Guide for Facility Managers. And it's really kind of my Bible as I go through and contemplate the best solution for various um, applications. But there's really three very simply, very simple principles. You need to meet the target light levels. The lighting has to meet the function of the space. You need to produce and deliver that light efficiently. If you're producing it efficiently, but it doesn't get delivered due to aiming the fixture wrong or putting it in the wrong place, it doesn't do anyone any good. And then automatic lighting controls. That's where we're really falling down right now. And we're hoping to, uh, to do more with that. <clears throat> Here's a, an example of tip, typical lumens per watt for various types of lighting. So you'll see that the least efficient is a standard incandescent. Halogen's a little bit better. Mercury vapor's on its way out, but is more efficient. Compact fluorescent, most of them are falling in the high end of this range now. Linear fluorescent's even better. Top end of that is about 90 lumens per watt where we're, we're working. Metal halide and high pressure sodium, particularly with pulse start and electronic ballast, fall at the high end of that range as well. They still remain very good light source options depending on the, on the application. Low pressure sodium is very efficient, but everyone hates it. Um, LED, this, this slide is a little bit old, but it's hard to know what to say with LED because it's really a buyer beware market right now. Some LEDs are definitely less efficient than their standard incandescent counterpart. Some LEDs are far more efficient than the most efficient linear fluorescent. But there's very little consistency in the marketplace right now. Um, it's really a matter of targeting a very specific application and choosing the right one for that, that purpose. I'll digress a little bit into lighting theory. Um, maybe, I apologize for the quality of this slide, but maybe you, many of you are familiar with the, the electromagnetic spectrum. X-rays are over here, shortwave radio is over here, visible lights in the middle from ultraviolet to infrared. When you hear us talk about color temperature, you may think a a yellow light is a warmer light, but it's actually a lower temperature. So it has to do with the, if you think of heating up a piece of iron, first it glows red, red hot, then it goes white hot, then it goes blue hot. So the higher temperature is more blue. This is an example of the color spectrum of sunlight. And you can see that the sun puts out light at all frequencies. Not exactly equally, but in a smooth distribution. By comparison, here's the color spectrum of incandescent, which is smooth, 
but you can see it's not the same as sunlight. Or cool light fluorescent, which has been enhanced with phosphors, but it has these big spikes. And that's due to the fluorescent technology. Here we have examples of the color spectrum of metal halide and high pressure sodium because those are um, high intensity discharge gas lamps. They produce very strong peaks at these various frequencies of the gases that are inside the lamp. So these slides are really just my way of telling you if somebody tries to sell you a full spectrum fluorescent lamp or if they try and sell you a daylight lamp, don't believe it because there is no such thing. Sunlight is sunlight. Anything else is not sunlight. Okay, that's the end of my spiel on that. But I just, a lot of people really believe that they're going to get exactly the same as the sun if they buy a lamp that says daylight on the box. Okay. Um, here's a little bit of lamp data. So here's where we're starting from. There's a T12 cool white lamp in the majority of cases, 34 watts. And the mean lumens of that is about 2300. T8 lamps start off at 28, 2900 lumens for your standard T8. There are other options available, which are the 25 and 30 watt, the low watt T8. Um, but what we really wanted to do was replace one for one that T12 with the T8 system that was going to produce the same amount of lumens as before. So that 2300 lumens was our target. And the way we did that, we chose the high lumen output lamp and we paired it, oops, skip forward a little bit here, we paired it with a low ballast factor ballast. That's not exactly the one we picked, but in that way, that initial 2950 is underdriven, which not only extends the life of the lamp, but kind of like Goldilocks with the porridge, it produces a light level that's just right. And we actually settled on, I believe, a, a 0.77 ballast factor that really was just right. The reason we chose to do that instead of using a low wattage, a 25 or a 30 watt lamp, was really a maintenance reason. This way we can stock a standard 32 watt lamp and not have to worry about five years from now, 10 years from now, somebody comes, takes out the 25 watt, puts in a 32 watt, and now our energy savings are gone. With the ballast being the one that's essentially controlling the amount of energy at a lower level, we don't have to worry about that. Another advantage, one of the reasons <coughs> that in the buildings we've done upgrades so far, everyone has been really uh, surprised. They seem to have higher light levels than what they had before, even though we've calculated the light level should be the same. And that's because of these depreciation factors. Over the life, you know, how many hours the lamp is operating, they degrade. And you can see that a T12, especially an 8-foot T12, degrades very quickly in terms of its output. So if if the building was old and the lamp was old, they were down here. We come in with a brand new T8, and they're up here. So in, uh, in a few years, they'll still be at 90%, but they're never going to be down here at 60% again. So that lumen maintenance is really he helps keep the output where it belongs. A little bit about ballast data, just to kind of show um, here are some, some T12 examples um, and some T8 examples. Again, the, the one that we settled on for our project is a little bit more efficient than this one here. It's a little bit better characteristics too. But there's, there's a wide range available, very wide range of ballasts available, and it's just a matter of picking the right one. So. We've determined our scope. We've determined our solution. Now we need to decide how to implement it, which, as you mentioned, is really the tricky part. Um, the engineering side is, is not the tricky part of a lighting retrofit. Um, one of the big things that was important to us was not to have to hire an outside consultant for engineering services. Not only does that add cost to the project, 
It adds a long time to the project schedule. And we felt that it would not add much value. So we needed to proceed with these projects in a way that would not require an outside consultant. So we chose to do all the audits in-house. We did our inventories in-house. And we purchased the materials directly through our shop, through our vendors. Um, that had a real advantage for us rather than hiring a contractor and having them furnish the labor and materials. So far we've saved a lot of money by doing it that way. And hiring a contractor for labor only, many contractors, especially specialty lighting retrofit contractors, prefer to work that way. They don't want to have to bother with materials and shipping and orders and getting the right thing. They just want to have their workers show up and do the job. So that's been really a win-win for us and for the contractors. Uh, we also are pursuing this with multiple crews at the same time. We have a pretty strict time frame for getting all the work done and there's a lot of work to be done. So we essentially have one crew per building. Right now we have two crews working. We're hoping, I'm hoping we can increase that to three at least. Um, right now they are at the Child Development Lab and the Advanced Computation Building. Over Christmas break we're hoping to do the law building. And when our staff electricians hopefully become available, we may have a crew of them helping out as well. Some of the side benefits, once this work is done, rather than just energy savings, as I mentioned, we also, also have improved quality of light. We've eliminated that flicker. Many of the old T12 ballasts were magnetic. And if any of you have ever been stuck under one, you know that after a long day, you've got a headache and you're cranky and you just don't want to be under that light anymore. Um, with the electronic ballasts that um, they switch at 20,000 times per second or faster, as opposed to 120. 120 times per second is actually visible to some people. Some people can't see it, some can. I can. Lumen maintenance we talked about. Occupants have been really satisfied so far. Um, one, of the, one of the little side benefits, the old magnetic ballasts, some of them contain PCBs, which is a harmful chemical that if, it, if there's a problem with that ballast housing and it leaks out, it can create a hazard. The old T12 lamps also were much higher in mercury than the lamps that are being manufactured today. So as a, as a side effect of taking these lamps and ballasts out, the new ones we're putting in have far lower mercury content and no PCBs. So that's a real, a real win. Less trash and waste than new fixtures. You know, why should you take a two foot by four foot white steel box out of the ceiling, throw it away, buy a new two foot by four foot white steel box and put it in the ceiling? Um, not only is it a waste of money, but it creates a lot of, a lot of trash that we don't need. Uh, we also get, get warranty and maintenance benefits from the equipment being new. <clears throat> okay, so this is, this is the part where you say, well, that's all well and good, but what problems did you have? We have, we have learned some things so far, uh, one of which is that many of our areas have sensitive research going on. And we need either shift work or we need special considerations. We need to work very closely with the occupants of the buildings in order to get that done without disrupting them. So we're contacting the department staff before we go in, telling them what schedule we intend to, to meet and hearing their concerns. Uh, anybody who's considering a project like this needs to consider recycling because you just can't take this stuff and throw it in the trash. Uh, we have on our campus had for years a full recycling of all lamps and ballasts through our main recycling facility but the sheer quantity that we have had as a result of this project has really been a challenge for them. Um, they've done a great job keeping up with it. So what used to be maybe a ballast or two a week is now 100 a day. And there were uh, logistical concerns that needed to be met there. Likewise, um, in each building, 
we need a laydown area. That's true of any construction project. But in this one in particular, we didn't want, for example, to have a, a barrel of old ballast that the guys are tossing stuff into. And you know, some engineering student wanders down the hallway and says, ooh, what's that? And takes it home. You know, if it's a PCB containing ballast, that would be bad news. So um, all of our things are locked up at the end of every day. One of the things that has really been a benefit to us is doing the labor on a per fixture basis. Um, it keeps, keeps us honest, keeps contractors honest, and it really enables us to stick to our expected budgets for the project rather than doing things on an hourly basis where they can have a potential of getting out of control. And then keeping a room by room record, that spreadsheet I showed you before, of what was actually done by the contractor in the field. So put all those things together and I really feel like um, a lighting retrofit is a really great um, type of project that it really hits this bullseye of the triple bottom line. <coughs> Probably most of you are familiar with the triple bottom line, but here you have people, here you have profit, and here you have the planet. And where they all overlap, we have something that's good economically, we have something that's good for our people, we have something that's good for the environment. So, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? questions? Primarily labor. Yep. So the materials, the lamps themselves haven't gone up that much? No, in fact, um, our materials costs have been very, very close to what we were budgeting, and the labor costs are more than we had initially been budgeting. So adjusting for that um, has really been what took us from 44 buildings down to, down to about 30. We are using 3,500 because that's the most common that we have on our campus. Um, there was one building at Mumford Hall that specifically asked for a 6,500, which is a much, much cooler, they call it daylight. Um, it's sort of a, a bluer white instead of a warmer white color. Um, that's, that's what they specifically wanted for their building. but. Almost every building on campus has got 3,500. Yeah. I think one of the changes in work habits uh, lately, well, over the last decade, has been a shift from paperwork to computer work. So mm -hmm. people are spending hours looking at a screen, don't necessarily need the bright lights so that they can read off the score and every place in the room. So, and you're putting lights in now that are new and giving them more light. So I wonder if there hasn't been some missed opportunity to really reducing the amount of intensity needed. Or even something like, I mean, I've been using, I've used the CFL little reading lamp on my desk, and the only time I put on the ugly ones on top is if I have to read something, get something on the bookshelf, or somebody comes in at night. So uh, probably something like that might even reduce much more, just giving everybody a little reading lamp. Like, when I first came in, we had reading lamps, didn't you? I took them all away. So anyway, just sorry. You're absolutely right. Um, if you walk into a private office, you know, a regular private office in a variety of buildings on our campus, you'll find a wide variety of lights, anywhere from, from a two-lamp fixture to two four-lamp fixtures and everywhere in between. Um, one of the things that those reflector kits actually allow us to do is by directing more of the light downward and reducing the number of lamps, depending on how you reduce it, if you go from four to three, you wind up with more light. If you go from four to two, you actually do have about a 10% drop in light level, in light output, I should say. Light level on the desk is gonna be very close to the same. But that 10% is almost imperceptible 
to your average person. So we're really trying to take advantage of that wherever we can, wherever we see those four lamp fixtures and get them down to three or down to two. Or if we see, um, if we happen to notice that a space just has a really high lighting level to start off with. One of the things that happened, I think, at the psychology building was that after we did our retrofit, the amount of light, again, as calculated, is the same, except that the old system wasn't working up to snuff. So they felt it was too bright when we were done. It's actually much simpler to do a delamping. Simply take one of the lamps out, and that gets the light level back to where, where you want it. So that's always an option after we've done our work. Is there a question? Any other questions? For the most part, um, we have a, a couple of meetings where we've talked to them about the expectations. They get a copy of that room by room spreadsheet and coordinate with the building users for keys and access and lay down, and then they go. Um, one of the things we've really been hoping is that they can. Um, have a dialogue with us continually during the project. In other words, if they get to a room and they say, why doesn't this room have a reflector kit? Um, I, think it's, I think it could use one. Then they're the ones out in the field. We certainly um, are taking their input and advice. So it's really, it's really a collaboration with them and, and having that flexibility. That's a good point, um, and it has come up. One of the fears, of course, is that we're going to get a bad batch, a bad run of lamps or a, you know, a shipment of ballasts that are all defective or something, and we don't know until we put them up in the space, and then they, they fail a week later. Um, so far, we have been really fortunate. We've had uh, very few infant mortality, but less than 1%, actually. And, um, the way we've resolved that has just been working directly with our supplier from our maintenance crew and um, just getting them replacement ballasts. So we're using that materials warranty. There, we did have an option at one point to uh, call the contractors back in for a warranty labor replacement. Um, it seems like that kind of is more trouble than it's worth. What if other buildings on campus want to improve their lighting network? One of the lucky ones. What do they do? Um, I would encourage them to, to call Terry Ruprecht, our director of Co energy conservation, or call me. Uh, I can tell you whether you're on the list. And if not, we can put you on the list. We'll get around, hopefully, someday, or, or work with you to try and find um, other ways to get the project accomplished. <coughs> 